Add Some Sugar to It, A Review of Literature on Sugar Culture in New Media by Simon Domingo, Shariza Esparago, and Mike Jordan San Pascual. So let's do a deep dive into what is sugar culture. The sugar dating phenomenon, or sugar culture, comes from niche websites that allow women and men to request for monetary compensation from sugar daddies or sugar mamas who ask for companionship or sexual intimacy in exchange. Now, there are a lot of stigmas surrounding sugar culture, so what is it not? Sugar dating or sugar culture is not considered prostitution. In Nair's study on dating for compensation in the digital age, they highlighted Dr. Drew Pinsky's panel discussion on the experiences of sugar babies. When a man commented on sugar dating as a way to pay debt and a financial agreement, the sugar baby replied by saying, I disagree with you. Financial support is a benefit. It's not the goal for me. I've always dated older men. Nair also cited the concept of bounded authenticity, which is a paid sexual exchange that includes an emotional intimacy that is experienced as genuine and mutual. But where does sugar culture take place? Perhaps the most popular is SeekingArrangement.com, which was launched in 2006 for sugar daddies or mommies and sugar babies who seek financial assistance in exchange for companionship or a mutually beneficial relationship. Other than SeekingArrangement.com, or SA for short, there are more than 20 sites that provide the space for sugar culture to take place. Although sugar culture is often dominated by sugar daddies and female sugar babies, the culture has expanded to gay men with sites like GayArrangement.com or GayArrangement.org and other niche websites across the internet. We can clearly understand that sugar culture is prevalent and dominant on online platforms, but how is sugar culture advertised in these online spaces? Mixon, in a 2018 study, notes that SA webpages advertise to aspiring sugar babies that sugar daddies come with a variety of financial responsibilities, including family, work expenses, or his own hobbies and interests, and that its members likely also hold high-paying jobs that carry crazy work hours and countless meetings. Meanwhile, sugar babies are individuals seeking mentorship, financial support, or general companionship under the terms of an agreed-upon arrangement, where discretion is a number one rule. But who participates in sugar daddy culture? Let's look at an overview of sugar culture characteristics. According to Class Daddy from Sugar Book, The qualities of an ideal sugar daddy can be summed up as someone with sufficient financial resources, a fun personality, i.e. a smart conversationalist with a solid sense of humor, someone that can draw people, especially his baby, dresses well, is a gentleman, and lives up to his expected role as a sugar daddy, i.e. financial support in exchange for companionship. The sugar baby, on the other hand, should show affection, look their best, and be available anytime their sugar daddy needs them. It is important to consider that these are the ideal qualities for each party. We'll take a deeper look into whether or not these standards are fair or realistic. But first, let's take a look at sugar culture by the numbers. So who are the sugar babies, really? In terms of sex and sexual identity, usually sugar babies are female, but there are some apps catering to the LGBTQIA community. Sugar babies come from a diverse pool of social strata, students, divorcees, housewives, and etc. Sugar babies have the freedom of choice and they are not forced to become sexual workers. 
In terms of economic status and education, the top three occupations of sugar babies are as follows. 46% are students, mostly college students looking to support their school expenses. 15% are from the entertainment industry and 10% are from the hospitality sector. In terms of race and age, there is no specific race for sugar babies, and they are often aged from 18 to 34 years old. Now, on to the sugar daddies and mommies. In terms of sex and sexual identity, usually sugar daddies and mommies are typically male, female, and members of the LGBTQIA community. 29% of sugar daddies are married men. And in terms of economic status and education, the top three occupations of sugar daddies are as follows. 28% are entrepreneurs, 22% are professionals, and 19% are executives. In terms of race and age, sugar babies and daddies can be found almost everywhere in the world, and sugar daddies are often aged 30 to 50 years old. Aside from the stats, one very important thing to look at is the glamorization of sugar culture in media. Is it real or reality? The film, television, and social media industry play a very big role in the constructed beliefs of society. It is rare to find someone that isn't looking at their phones nowadays or binging something on a streaming site. That being said, the portrayal of sugar culture, in turn, greatly affects societal perception. As we can see from our earlier definitions, Sugar culture creates a clear divide between prostitution and being a sugar baby on paper. Prostitution has the negative and mostly illegal connotation that parties involved in sugar culture want to avoid. However, sugar culture cannot be removed from its uglier counterpart and the lines actually blur. Earlier portrayals of glamorous lives and financial support from sugar daddies continued to blur that line between sex work and sugar culture. Two notable films that merit further discussion in regard to the glamorization of sex work include Casino and Pretty Women. Both films tell stories of prostitutes who meet wealthy men that fall in love with them and treat them well. In Casino, though the woman Ginger is no longer working as a prostitute, the film still depicts prostitution as providing the opportunity for women to meet a good man and live happily ever after. Pretty Woman tells this story at a more alarming rom-com availability. Edward solicits Vivian on Hollywood Boulevard. He fits the profile of a sugar daddy as a wealthy businessman who is seeking a companion. Vivian is then pampered to kingdom come, rom-com hijinks ensues, and they fall in love and have a fairy tale romance. Despite the assurances of financial compensation and security from sugar dating websites and the glamorization of the culture and media, the lived experiences of people participating in sugar culture tell a whole different story. On paper, it seems like an enticing and safe venture to gain financial support for companionship. However, the world of sugar dating is simply a candy-coated version of prostitution, according to author of The Arrangement, Robin Harding. The sugar babies she interviewed have to go to great lengths to protect themselves from the violence and abuse that often goes unreported in sugar dating. A 2007 study done by Holt and Blevins examined sex work from the client's perspective and found that these Johns create a set of standards and even a numerical scale for the ideal street worker, or SW. They often have to be women with beautiful physiques but without anything too plastic or fake. They also favored the girlfriend experience or GFE, as they call it, above all, where they could bond with the SW before intercourse. The GFE is strikingly similar to what we now know as sugar dating. 
One important finding from the study is that clients seek out paid sex, but do not want to deal with a woman whose demeanor constantly reminded them of this fact. While these Johns are raiding women, on the other hand, the sugar babies Robin Harding interviewed have a different system set up. Harding found that these girls also had their own terminology, using terms like salty for men who offer money and trips in order to get a baby into bed but don't follow through, and splenda, men who want to be sugar daddies but lack the financial means. Sex-positive female empowerment groups online let women share warnings about bad men and advice like how to spot a fake PayPal account. But sometimes these precautions are not enough. Sometimes, behind the tantalizing profile of a sugar daddy, there's a con man or a psychopath, according to Harding. In one case, two sugar babies prove that it's clear that the risk of this job is high and not as secure as sites make it out to be. At the insistence of the client, they got their hair professionally blown out, wore heavy makeup and sexy clothing for an intimate night out. When he got what he wanted, he agreed to reimburse them for the room, the salon, and pay the two of them for intercourse. But it wasn't until he was long gone that the girls realized he had never fulfilled the payment. But losing money, while upsetting, is getting off easy. Take, for example, two Toronto sisters who lived a life of luxury in Lagos, Nigeria, thanks to the generosity of some of the richest men in Africa. They were even documented as the Canadian Kardashians. But when a relationship turned sour, the sisters ended up in a Nigerian prison charged with extortion. They were eventually able to flee the country with the help of Canadian diplomats, but not everyone is so lucky. Sugar dating and sugar culture raise a conversation on sex work, sex exploitation, and sensuality that needs to be had. Whether or not it is sex work, the exploration of sex positivity, sexual shame, and ownership over one's image and identity are called into question. On one end, sugar dating is a way that women can own their sexuality. As a Harvard Crimson writer wrote in February 2021, why should this concept be strange? We pay people, therapists notably, to talk to us about our problems and help maintain our mental health. Why do we consider the acceptance of money for companionship, essentially conversations and time, as inappropriate? However, on the other end, it is not just conversations and time. There is the exploited and lived reality of the average sugar baby, a life not lived strung along the arms of a silver fox with diamond necklaces in tow, but one filled with uncertainty moral compromise, and under-the-radar abuse. Social media only served to add fuel to this normalization of what is ultimately sex work. Platforms such as Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, and more recently TikTok perpetuate the notions of hoe culture, scamming, marrying rich, and sugar baby aesthetics. The rapid trends and need to keep up appearances has a lot of users itching for luxuries they can't afford and supposedly easy ways to get these funds. While being a sugar baby can be a lucrative business, it has proved to be something that is in no means easy. There are unspoken rules and important measures that sugar babies especially have to take to avoid exploitation and abuse. Maybe, instead of such a glamorization and normalization, these arrangements can be regulated so that the concept of Financial support for companionship is as true to its word as possible. Thank you so much for listening to our presentation. We hope that you have a wonderful day and that this will strike some conversations worth having.